Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Impossible State podcast. Uh, once again, we're doing it live here in CSIS Studios, so it's both podcast online, but also viewable online. My name is Victor Cha, Senior Vice President for Asia and Korea Chair at CSIS, Vice Dean and Professor at Georgetown. Um, and today we have um, two great guests with us to talk about the whole question of what we do with North Korea. I think the title of the podcast is should we sign a peace treaty with North Korea? That's largely to get you to watch certain, listen to the podcast. Um, but I'm sure we'll be talking about that and a number of other things with our two experts who are joining us today, uh, Jenny Town and Frank Ohm. Um, so let me pr uh, properly introduce them before we get started. I want to welcome back Jenny Town to the Impossible State podcast. Uh, Jenny, um, as our listeners know, is a senior fellow at the Stimson Center and director of Stimson's 38 North program. She was named one of Worth Magazine's Groundbreakers 2020, 50 Women Changing the World, and one of Fast Company's Most Creative People in Business in 2019. Uh, previously, she served as Assistant Director of the U.S. Korea Institute at SAIS, uh, and she holds a BA in East Asian Studies and International Relations from Westmar University, and a master's in international affairs from Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. So she's part of the Columbia Mafia in DC. I'm part of that mafia too. Uh, also joining us, I think for the first time on the Impossible State is Frank Alm. Uh, Frank is the senior expert on Northeast Asia at the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, from 2010 to 2017, he worked at the Department of Defense, including a special counsel to the Army General Council, Special Assistant to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asia and Pacific Security Affairs, and Senior Advisor on North Korea in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Uh, he's a former Fulbright Scholar. So you were in Jeju during your Fulbright? I was, yes. Oh, that's interesting. Oh. 1997, long time ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was a Fulbright in 1990, so even long, longer ago. Jenny was probably not even born when I was a Fulbright <laughs> Scholar. but. Uh, um, and um, Frank received his bachelor's from Dartmouth, uh, his master's degree from the Kennedy School at Harvard, and his JD from the University of California, Berkeley. So um, it's a really a pleasure to have both of you with us today. Um, uh, both of you follow the North Korea situation very closely, but for our listeners, just to catch them up, uh, 2023 has been uh, already been proven to be a remarkable year. Uh, we thought last year was remarkable, but North Korea right now is more than on pace uh, to match uh, at least the quantity and probably surpass the quality of the uh, weapons demonstrations that they've been doing over the past year. Uh, thus far, we've seen uh, five uh, short-range ballistic missile tests. We've seen cruise missile tests. We've seen ICBM tests. We've even seen a close-range ballistic missile test. Um, in addition to that, they are demonstrating all of these new capabilities. Uh, very large, uh, multiple rocket launch uh, systems. Uh, they've talked about a strategic cruise missile. Um, they did their first silo-based missile launch. Most of these launches, as we know, have been either from um, uh, stand-up stations or from mobile launchers, but now they've shown that they're doing silo-based missile launching. Uh, underwater attack drones. Uh, I think the North Korean leader viewed publicly a tactical nuclear warhead um, testing hypersonic missiles, and they tested what we believe was their first uh, successful Hwasong-17 liquid-fueled ballistic missile. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on. In addition to that, um, we never miss an opportunity to talk about satellite imagery, as I know 38 North does as well. Um, but this is some imagery that we have from uh, recent imagery of the uh, Sohei launch station, uh, 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 rocket launch station. This is sort of an overview of the station, but the things that are, are most interesting is that there's a lot of activity now taking place there. Um, we've reported on it, uh, 38 North has reported on it. Uh, this is the west construction site where there looks to be a lot of work in terms of building a massive tunnel um, and then if we, uh, if we look at um, the, wait, let me see if I can do this correctly. Is that Kungiri, the No, this no, is, this is, this is a Sohei uh, satellite launch facility. 
So this is all that, this is all work they're doing on what looks to be a massive underground uh, underground tunnel. Um, and then uh, let me see if I can. Uh, and then this, I think you guys reported on this as well. Right. Uh, this is the pier area where they appear to be um, building a capability that both the tunnel and the pier suggest they're building the capability to bring much larger missiles to the Sohei, um, uh, uh, to the Sohei site. So uh, this is all by way of introduction to say that it, there's a lot going on with North Korea and um, and we need a lot of help trying to understand uh, what's behind it and what's next and what we should be doing about it. So if I could begin by asking both of you the, the question about, um, and I think I know the answer to the question, but I'll ask it anyway, which is um, given North Korea has really uh, traveled leaps and bounds in terms of their technology and their capabilities, and given how far they've come, there have been some voices out there that say we should just accept them now as a nuclear weapon state, not um, not focus so much on denuclearization and really give up that as a goal. So just to start uh, start the conversation off, I'd love to get your views on that particular that particular question. So uh, maybe we'll start with with Jenny. Sure. And welcome back to the program. Thanks. Well, thanks for having me back. And it, it's definitely a busy time. The North Koreans have been very active. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's worth giving up the goal of denuclearization. Um, it's not something that they're necessarily asking for, um, and it doesn't serve our interests. Uh, but I do think we need to be more realistic about the challenge, the, the nature of the challenge that we're actually dealing with here. And it isn't preventing North Korea from going nuclear. It isn't a, a non-proliferation challenge. It is a disarmament challenge. North Korea has nuclear weapons. They have nuclear technologies. They are building capabilities. Um, they have an extensive program and extensive infrastructure to grow that program. Um, so in order to convince them then that disarmament, nuclear disarmament is really a feasible choice, the right choice, a, a beneficial choice, is really going to take a much different strategy than what we're doing right now. Um, because we do have to remember none of this is happening in a political vacuum. There is actually an arms race going on in Asia beyond North Korea that certainly North Korea is exacerbating, but it isn't just about North Korea. It is about larger strategic interests and strategic competition throughout the region. Um, and what they're doing is a lot on par with what other countries are doing, but they're the only ones right now that are under sanctions, so that is prohibited activities. But if we want to convince an insecure country, a country that is surrounded by nuclear giants and economic giants, um, that has a political system that we fundamentally disagree with, um, that they should disarm and, and trust us and they'll be safe, uh, it's, it's a pretty tall order. And I think we need to better internalize what we're really asking them to do and why this is not such an easy decision for them to make. Yeah, that's an, you know, that's an interesting point. I mean, when we focused on denuclearization in the past, um, we were largely doing it in, in, I mean, this is just generalizations, but an external security environment that was relatively stable, right? right? And the, the one variable, of course, was North Korea, but overall it was relatively stable. Having a denuclearization conversation when at the same time there's a war in Europe, yeah. China's assertiveness or all, all that we're doing with Taiwan, uh, Japan's new defense strategy, South Korea's buildup, that, that, um, that is a very different environment, right, in which to have this conversation. If, if it, it, and perhaps it not, it's not possible to have that conversation. Frank, your Yeah, views. I mean, I, I agree with Jenny, and I also think that we need to think a little bit more about uh, what it mean, what we mean by accept, right? Because if we're asking whether we should accept North Korea as a nuclear weapon state under the definition of the non-proliferation treaty, then of course the answer is clearly no, right? Or we can ask whether we should accept uh, North Korea as a nuclear weapon country for the purposes of uh, military and policy planning. And I think if we think about it from that sense, we essentially already accept North Korea as, as a nuclear weapon state in terms of how the military plans for North Korea, our exercises, our, our internal planning processes, our policy planning. Um, but I think really what we're talking about um, for the most part is whether we should accept North Korea as a nuclear state um, 
um, from a diplomatic economic perspective. So in other words, should we accept North Korea, a nuclear North Korea, uh, and normalize relations with them? I think that's what really we're talking about, right? And I think if we're, uh, from that perspective, you know, it's, we get to the question of the prompt for this episode is should we ha sign a peace treaty with North Korea? I think it's very difficult because to do that, um, you need to have congressional support, right? There's a, that's a very high bar. So if we're talking about a peace treaty with North Korea, we're looking at two-thirds approval from the Senate. And I think in the current environment where there's a general bipartisan consensus that North Korea is a, a, a bad actor and that we need to continue pressure on North Korea, uh, it's very unlikely that we're going to get any sort of peace treaty with North Korea. But even setting that aside, and if we're talking about uh, having some sort of agreement that uh, accomplishes all the aims of a peace treaty. So basically having an administration that signs an executive agreement with North Korea, well then um, I don't think we'll get the type of congressional support that's necessary for an executive agreement because you need things like appropriations, you need uh, potentially down the line uh, relief from unilateral sanctions uh, that the U.S. imposes on North Korea. Uh, so I think all of these things make it very difficult. Even when we have a peace treaty or when we sign treaties with other countries, we've seen in the past that the U.S. has withdrawn. So things like the INF Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, the, the, the Mutual Defense Treaty with Taiwan. So it's hard to find a situation where we can provide the assurance to North Korea that they need. Um, um, so these are all the factors that we need to be thinking about when we think with, of, of accepting North Korea as a nuclear weapon country. Uh, but I think ultimately I agree with Jenny that We'll never get the support from Congress that we need unless there is denuclearization somewhere in the framework, right? And even if it's long-term, aspirational, fig leaf type of denuclearization, right? Unless we have that in the framework, I don't think we'll get the support from Congress that we need to provide the things that lay the foundation for a broader, enduring peace with North Korea. Yeah. Okay, all right, very interesting. So the word denuclearization has to be in there somewhere, right? You said fi as a fig leaf, at least, right? right. Um, so I, I, I do want to talk more about peace regime, peace treaty, security assurances, no first use in, in a minute. But um, let me ask you the question that I get asked every day in, in, in DC, and I don't have an answer to it, so I hope you do, which is, um, you know, when do we think that they're going to be willing to do any of these things? We have to be able to negotiate with them, right? right? We have to sit at a, a table with them. That it's been a long time, right, since that has happened. And uh, when do you think that they would be willing to return to the table, if, if ever? When do you think they'd be re ready to return, Jenny? I, I think we're a long way off mm -hmm. from that. And and again, given how the security situation in the region is unfolding there's really no incentive for them to do that. Um, not only is there the disappointment of the 2018-2019 summit process, um, and we did see a decided shift in the way that North Korea approaches the U.S. and South Korea after that, um, and a real sort of disillusionment with dealing with the U.S. and the idea that they could get, you know, things like sanctions relief that would bring about, you know, these breakthrough moments. Um, that they could hold up domestically as well to justify moving forward. Um, but on top of that, again, you know, as we said, you know, South Korea is building up arms, Japan is building up arms, China is going through nuclear modernization and trying to increase their arsenals. There's a war going on in Russia. This is not an environment where North Korea in the middle of that is going to stand up and say, hey, we're willing to put limits on our own programs while everyone else builds up around us. So I think we have to be realistic that until the security situation starts to move in a more positive direction, having meaningful engagement with North Korea on any kind of either arms control or denuclearization talks are very unlikely. Um, but I do think there's greater urgency now to at least get North Korea to the table, if not about nuclear issues, at least about tension reduction, risk reduction measures um, to help try and prevent, you know, the kind of accidents to turn into, you know, escalate into conflict um, that we're, we're starting to see now with this sort of drill for drill responses and escalating, you know, muscular rhetoric on, on the peninsula. So, you know, I think if we aim a little lower at the mm -hmm. moment just to get the ball rolling and, and try and reestablish some kind of relationship with North Korea. I think that's our best bet right now, but we're a long way off from getting back to the nuclear issue. 
So it's it's a and, and in addition to that, it's COVID, right? The COVID. So you have the external security situation, right? Everybody's building up right yeah. now. Everybody's internally balancing right now. I think you're right. The legacy of the twenty um, the twenty eighteen summit, I think, really matters here, yeah. right? They really feel like they were burned by that. And then you know they're starting just to eke out of COVID now, right? I guess. Um, foreign missions are being invited back in now, so they're starting. But but so that's a lot, right? That's a lot that makes it. No one should be hopeful that there's going to be a, a, a willingness to talk tomorrow. I guess so. Uh, Frank, uh, your thoughts on this or anything? You yeah, want I mean, to expand I agree with Jenny, Jim and said, I think it's yeah. going to be a while before um, North Korea feels comfortable and uh, that the environment is right, that they have the leverage to return to talks. And I feel like you know we're we're in uncharted territory because. In the past, typically, it's been North Korea that has clamored for talks with the U.S., and we've been the ones that have been able to say yes or no or set preconditions. Um, but I feel like in recent years, the, the tables have turned, and now it's us, uh, the U.S., that's saying, you know, we're open to talks without preconditions, and it's North Korea that feels like it has the confidence to, to be patient and wait us out. So the question really is, uh, in this environment, what can we do to get North Korea to come back to talks? I think the bar has been raised. I think the costs have increased. Um, I think it would be helpful to look to the academic literature and the research on, on when the environment is right for peace processes to begin. And, and you know, there's things like, uh, and, and you're familiar with this, the, the, the theory of GRIT uh, by Charles Osgood, G-R-I-T standing for graduated reciprocation and tension reduction. And the basic idea is that, you know, one country needs to, to offer a unilateral uh, conciliatory gesture to dissolve mistrust and begin a process of reciprocation. Um, Charles Kupchan at, at Georgetown University has similar research, uh, ba uh, basically saying that it's oftentimes the stronger country that takes the opening gambit because it's in a position to assume the risks uh, of the other country not uh, following through and reciprocating, right? Uh, and then if we follow this uh, process, then obviously there's many other things that we can think about in terms of incentives. Great. Um, so I do want to move to, to, to that next point, which is, you know, given, as Jenny laid out, there, you know, there are a number of reasons why um, they might not come back to talk. Some of them are internal, right? Some of them are external. Um, and then the question is, how do we get them back to talks? Um, the, uh, the traditional or uh, dip diplomatic response has always been this notion of carrots and sticks, or, or uh, the, I think the Japanese coined the term pressure and dialogue, right? That combination of things. So I guess the first question I have um, for you is, do you think that that combination is something that works or doesn't work? And, and I'm assuming that both of you don't think the pressure side really works very well. Um, uh, but then on the incentive side, like what are some of the things that we can, that we can pursue? So, um, so Jenny, if you could uh, first, like this whole question of carrots and sticks, pressure and dialogue, and then if not that, then what are, if, if it is along the lines of grit or something like that, what are, what are the incentives that you think uh, would actually matter to the North Koreans? Yeah, I think when it comes to the concept of, of pressure, the economic pressure, we just don't have the leverage. As, and in, even as Frank was saying, um, you know, the North Koreans really have been in the driver's seat in this process. Like, we want them to do something. It gives them, you know, the, um, the agency in, in controlling how far and how fast the process can go. But, um, you know, the North Koreans are also very results-oriented. Kim Jong-un has also been, you know, shown to want things very quickly. He wants sort of rapid results, rapid, um, you know, tangible things that he can show for his work and hold up to show that he, as a leader, is, is moving in the right direction. And I think the way that we've gone about this process is that, you know, the, the pressure side builds up quickly, but the incentive side is sort of long-term incentives that they might get at the end of a process. And I think we need to rethink that notion. And, you know, yes, we should be going first. There are things that we could be doing to sort of show that results are possible. Um, 
But there's also things that we need to do early on in a process. And I, I think the way we've approached negotiations in the past have always been you know, looking for these big framework agreements, even in 2019, where the end goal wasn't necessarily denuclearization. We were willing to come up with sort of a first step. But basically, all the things that we were willing to do were still held hostage to having a package deal versus being able to do a few things up front unilaterally, like the North Koreans did in 2018, to even get to the negotiating table. Um, you know, they took small steps like um, you know, demolishing the test tunnel entrances at Pungeri to show that they weren't going to test anytime soon. Um, they started to dismantle the the launch pad that you just showed earlier mm -hmm. and the satellite imagery. You know, these weren't denuclearization, but they were certainly unilateral steps that they were taking to show that something different was possible. Handing over the boxes of remains and the remains, the handing over the detainees. Right. Um, and even, you know, internally, they did a lot of work to remove a lot of the negative propaganda against the U.S. and South Korea in domestic narratives as well. So, you know, until we are able to also play that game and, and really show that different results are possible, that results are possible in the short term as well as the long term while we're negotiating more long term goals, um, I don't think we're, you know, we're going to have much more success than we've had already, which is obviously not a lot of success given the state of North Korea's WMD programs today. Yeah, yeah. So uh, um, very interesting. So let me, um, so Frank wrote a piece for Foreign Affairs recently um, called Don't Isolate North Korea. And then there's one section that has this, one uh, section of the article has this great paragraph, the title of which is Go First and Go Big. <laughs> and here you say um, that, uh, um, uh, let me just quote, you say that this, po this policy should be accompanied by unambiguous conciliatory gestures. For example, a moratorium on the deployment of U.S. strategic assets. Washington could also temporarily reduce military exercises, show a willingness to declare an end to the Korean War, offer sanctions relief in exchange for commensurate denuclearization measures and the ban on U.S. citizens traveling to North Korea and provide humanitarian aid and COVID-19 vaccines, um, as well as a letter uh, uh, about the possible, a possible meeting uh, from Biden to Kim. So, um, so again, following along this line of argument uh, with regard to you know, grit, incentives, go first, go big. Um, um, so my question to, to both of you is that when I, I read this, when I looked at this list, right, as a former negotiator, I was like, you know, I think in one way or another, we kind of did all these things at one point or another. So, you know, I, my question is, so what makes you think it would work this time that didn't before? Maybe it's because it's one big, it's one big push together, but I'd love to hear your, your thoughts. Well, on first this. of all, I'm glad that you listed all those. I don't think I could have remembered them, and so <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I have a broader point to make, but I, I just really quickly in response to your question, how would I respond to that is um, that first, we have tried a lot of those things, so I think it gives us a little bit of reassurance because we're not um, doing things that um, are too risky, right? Um, we don't want to undermine our security to the point that it's just not a viable option to offer a lot of these things. But I think in response to the argument that some people make that say, you know, we tried all these things in the past and they don't work. How would I would respond to that is, first, they do work. You know, we've seen evidence that they do work. Maybe they haven't endured and they haven't been sustained. But the thing to, to do in response to that is to sustain these incentives and measures, right? So they're not short-term things that we give and then we take away or they uh, dissipate over time, but they, they're things that should be continued. So. Um, for example, in the situation with the uh, agreed framework in 2002, when we heard that you know, North Korea was uh, developing a potential covert uranium enrichment facility, that is a situation where we would have, we should have continued negotiation and pro continued to provide the incentives, and maybe we would not be in a situation where we are today. But I want to take a step back and refer to a chart uh, that I provided that maybe gives a better uh, insight into how I think about the whole pressure and dialogue debate. And it's a chart that um, 
hopefully you can put it up on screen. Um, it's a chart um, that was created by the CSIS Missile Defense Project, and it shows uh, ballistic missile launches by North Korea from 1984 uh, to the current uh, uh, present day, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think most people in DC would look at this chart and they would say, wow, you know, there's this, been this uh, tremendous increase in North Korean uh, ballistic missile launches, uh, certainly over the last 10 years or so. And uh, it shows how they're becoming more belligerent, they're becoming more of a threat, and so we need to enhance deterrence uh, and take these measures to reduce the threat, right? And I think that's uh, perfectly fine. But another way to look at it is to look at those periods where there are uh, less provocative activities, in this case, ballistic missile launches, right? So what's happening, you'll see, it's hard to see um, from here, but there is a period, uh, a void of, of circle dots, right? Basically between 1994 and 2002. What's happening during that period? Well, we know that's when right. negotiations, uh, the agreed framework, not only, the, not only a situation where the two sides were complying with the agreed framework, but they are also engaged in missile talks, peace treaty talks, um, the Perry process, the summit tree in 2000, and we can also look in uh, that void in 2011, in 2018, well, what was happening in those years in which North Korea refrained from nuclear and missile testing? Of course, the negotiations we were in that led up to the Leap Day deal and the negotiations that led up to Singapore, right? So uh, I, I think um, the point here is that um, we, we know what works, right? When we're engaging with North Korea, they tend to behave better. And uh, uh, your former colleague, Lisa Collins, had that great study in 2017 that showed a strong correlation uh, between periods of uh, US DPRK uh, engagement and lower levels of DPRK provocations. Um, of course, correlation is not causation, but I think this is a very striking pattern and something that warrants further policy analysis. And then there's the corollary, right, which is periods of, of pressure against North Korea. So when we think about the six-year period between 2012 and 2018, the end of the Leap Day deal to the Singapore summit, that, that six-year period was the longest absence of U.S. DPRK negotiations over the last 30 years, right? It also coincided with the period when we embarked on a global pressure campaign, uh, diplomatic isolation, military pressure, economic sanctions against North Korea. And how did North Korea respond to that um, uh, pressure campaign in that six years? With the greatest advances in North Korea's nuclear weapons program, right? Four nuclear tests, over 90 ballistic missile tests. And we're seeing a similar pattern since 2019, right? And you see the huge increase in, in mis, uh, ballistic missile launches over the last few years. So um, I think it's pretty uh, obvious why North Korea is behaving this way. Um, they are under the siege mentality where they feel like if they don't respond to pressure with pressure, then they look weak and they only invite further attempts at coercion, right? And so it's not surprising to me when Kim Jong-un explained his uh, approach to U.S. policy uh, back in 2021. Uh, he basically explained it as the principle of pressure for pressure, goodwill for goodwill. And I think that's the, the, the type of principle that we need to be thinking about when we uh, envision new approaches to North Korea. So, so picking up from there, um, so this is you know, this, you remember Lee Siegel wrote a book about this, Disarming Strangers, many years ago that looked at the agreed framework negotiations as a tit-for-tat, basically, negotiation. But, uh, I, so I have two questions. The, f the first is, in terms of this list of incentives that we talk about, um, on the one hand, the political reality here is they, they can't deviate too far from things that we've offered in the past, like to get them through the interagency so that people feel like, no, this is, you know, we've done this before, there's a precedent for this, right? But then at the same time, if there's a precedent for it, then as a signal, it's less meaningful to North Korea, right? Because they're like, oh, you already did that before, right? So, so that's one dilemma. The other dilemma, uh, and I'd le love to hear Jenny's views on this, is that, um, <clears throat> You know, there's, the North Koreans are receiving these signals. Let's say, let's play this diplomatic scenario out. They're receiving these signals. But as you know what, like it, it's hard for them to change course, right? It's hard for them, every signal from the United States they assume is duplicitous, right? So it's very hard for them to change course. And it's, 
I think it's very hard from somebody we know well, like Che Sun He, to be able to sit there and receive these signals, and she may see right. that things are changing. Like these are a sequence of things that the United States is doing, but like how does that work in the North Korean system? How does that translate in the North Korean system? Well, a hard question, I know. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I think we're in a situation where, yes, a lot of these things have been done before, have been tried before, have had various levels of success, have not been sustainable over time. Um, and that has damaged the utility of them as well. But I, I think there's a certain level of because it's done before, um, I don't think it has less value to the North Koreans, but I think the North Koreans believe it should be an easier decision going forward. We should be able to make the decision move faster. It shouldn't have to be a year-long negotiation on some of these things. Um, but I think we, we've gotten to a point now where, yes, we tried things, but we tried things under very different political conditions. North Korea was in a much weaker state at that point in time. Um, we had more leverage and we had more to take away in that process. Right now, we just don't have the leverage in, in terms of the economic side of the equation. We've now removed the majority of their major like commercial activities like textiles and seafood, um, as well as you know their access to outside energy resources like you know oil. Uh, uh, oil. Um, we've We've limited how much coal they can export. Um, and yet we still then lament how they're not engaging in economic reforms or their economic reforms are actually retrenching into more of a command system. Well, if they don't have the opportunities to engage in actual commerce on a legal level, those reforms would have never been successful and Kim Jong-un also has to show something for his own leadership. So in some essence, you know, a lot of our policies have been self-defeating um, in terms of our goals of who we want North Korea to be, not just on the nuclear issue. Um, because now it just gives North Korea so much excuse to say, well, you know, our economy is failing because of sanctions rather than because of internal policy choices. And I think, you know, if you're Chae Sun Hee, for instance, um, you know, in Pyongyang after 2019, the pressure is on. Um, again, the North Koreans are very results oriented. They go into negotiations uh, with mandates and with you know, expectations that they're going to get something, they have to get something relatively quickly to show for those choices. Um, and after 2019, the negotiating team that didn't get what they really believed they were going to get, they're all gone, except for Chae Sun Hee, which is gonna make her much more cautious going forward as to what she's confident in um, and what she really believes she can win if she goes back to negotiations. I think that's one of our also problems with our approach right now is that by, by leaning into the pressure signaling, deterrence signaling, yes, we're saying, you know, we're willing to talk anytime, anywhere, but we're, we're not giving any sense that would build her confidence that if she came back, something could be accomplished that she could go back to Pyongyang and hold up as a success to again, to justify moving forward. Um, I think we saw when Kim Jong-un came into power, he was willing to do different things. He's willing to change his mind pretty quickly when he believes there's benefit to doing so, um, but change it just as quickly uh, when that fails and he needs to then you know, justify the decisions that he made or move into a different tactic. So I don't think we're completely, I don't think the door to diplomacy is completely closed, but I think we have to be more aware of the pressures on them as well um, for them to come to the table. Yeah, talking about co conflicting signals, I mean, you know, on the one hand, we talk about ideas like this in terms of incentives. On the other hand, there's a demand signal from the allies for right. more of the other, right? right. Uh, more exercising, more, you know, missile defense tracking, ASW, you name it, like the entire, uh, the, the entire range of things. So how do you square that circle, Frank? How do you, how do you, how do you square that it's circle? It's difficult. I mean, I, I wrote about in the Foreign Affairs article that, you, that we are sending mixed messages um, when we talk about the willingness to engage with North Korea on one hand. Uh, and then on the other, we expand the scale and scope of military exercises. We return the deployment of U.S. strategic assets. President Biden is asked by journalists, 
hey, do you have a message for Kim Jong-un? And his message, his opportunity is, hello, period, right? Annyeong, good, right? That doesn't <laughs> seem like a very uh, warm way to conduct outreach, right? It's a little confusing message. And so um, at the same time, there is alliance management involved, and you have uh, Japan and South Korea administrations that want to increase pressure on North Korea. So there's a bit of uh, the alliance management uh, skill that's involved. But unfortunately, it's... You know, the Biden administration is right on board with their approaches to North Korea, so there's no dissonance there, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, looking to the future, like what do you, I mean, so we know North Korea is continuing on this uh, weapons demonstration or exercising path. Um, there is uh, very little help coming from China right now um, uh, because they really, are focusing on this as a piece of the cost that the U.S. pays for our strategic competition uh, policy with China. Uh, Russia and North Korea appear to be growing closer. I mean, there's opportunity for both of them in that relationship. And South Korea and Japan, as you said, Frank, are drawing closer in this trilateral military relationship. And it doesn't appear that either seem to be interested in any sort of engagement with North Korea. So. As this rolls forward, like, what piece do you see moving here? Like, you know, what piece of this is going to move that provides an opening, if at all? So, it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't, th I don't think the the moving piece will be China. Um, I, I feel like over, over the last decade or so, um, starting, I mean. I mean, actually, you could probably go back a, a lot earlier, but I, I clearly remember during the Obama administration, uh, we had this China-centered approach, right? Uh, some people called it the son of that. So the idea is that um, we tell China that if they don't do more to rein in North Korea's behavior, then they're going to start to see things that they find, they find very adverse, right? like the, the THAAD deployment, right? Um, we saw this during the, the presidential debates. Um, in 2020, there was one question on North Korea, and they asked President Biden uh, how he would respond. Uh, and instead of saying, this is what I would tell Kim Jong-un, he said, this is what I would tell China, right? And he goes with the same, uh, um, uh, you know, the approach of increasing pressure on China, uh, and then hopefully that translates to North Korea as well. Um, but I just don't think that this approach will work because China's, uh, their thinking is more along the lines of how do we incentivize uh, better behavior from North Korea, including through things like sanctions relief. And so when we try to get China to adopt our pressure-based approach, which they find will not work and which they think may destabilize North Korea, it's, it's just not a recipe for success. So I think that's one um, uh, pathway that I don't think will provide fruit in the future. Any. Yeah, China's not the answer. And I, I do remember in, in track two meetings with North Koreans in the past, there was one time, for instance, where um, a proposal had been passed from the U.S. government through China to the North Koreans, and the North Koreans had responded positively to half of it and not to the other half of it. And in subsequent track two meetings, we had asked, why didn't you agree to the other half? And they had no idea what we were talking about because the Chinese had never presented it to them because they had already filtered out the part that they thought was acceptable. So, you know, yes, fundamentally, the U.S. and China have different approaches to North Korea. Um, right now, we don't have, you know, the, the relationship to, to get on the same page. Um, and at the end of the day, China will still filter through their interests. Um, I think right now, we're actually, though, in need of a third-party intervention. Mm. Um, not China, not someone from the region, but an actual third party that can be somewhat neutral at least or have the facade of neutrality to sort of create a diplomatic process or opening to at least, again, start to talk about tension reduction, um, the conduct of drills, the, even the, the code of conduct in, in, in conducting drills. Like, for instance, you know, the U.S. and South Korea, obviously, when we're doing drills, we always... Um, message in advance that they are drills, what we're doing, this kind of scope and scale of them. 
um, while the North Koreans do missile launches, for instance, and then tell us afterwards <laughs> that it was a drill. Well, you know, this obviously leaves a lot of room for misinterpretation, misperception. Um, and if there was even just a way to have, to start talks about like, if you're going to do these drills, here's a code of conduct that you should follow, that other countries follow as well. You know, those are the kinds of, you know, uh, I think diplomatic channels and, and conversations that I think would be helpful now to help reduce tensions and could create different openings than to have larger talks about, you know, regional tension reduction, risk reduction measures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, clearly um, we've looked at all sides of this Rubik's Cube and there are clearly not any easy answers, but... Um, I do have a follow-up point yeah. just on, on the issue of sanctions, because I feel like I mean, clearly that is one of the, the major thrusts of our current approach to, to North Korea. Uh, for, for good reasons, and, and certainly from the, point, uh, the standpoint of Congress, that's one of the main tools that they use, um, and one of those tools that we find is less provocative and, and threatening, and yet, and yet at the same time could be impactful on North Korea. Um, so I feel like, you know, there's obviously a lot of studies about the impact and effectiveness of sanctions. There's the seminal study by Gary Huffbauer that looked at 115 cases of sanctions, and they found that in, in 40 instances, uh, sanctions were effective in changing the behavior of rogue states. Uh, there's another study by Robert Pape that criticizes the Huffbauer study and says that if you control for factors like the use of force, then it's really um, not 34% effective like it was in the Huffbauer uh, research, but actually 4% effective, right? And if we look in the case of uh, North Korea, um, just, I'm not seeing compelling evidence to show that sanctions are effective in changing behavior. They may be effective in inflicting pain on North Korea, that's a separate question, but changing North Korean behavior, I'm not seeing evidence. You had the two guests on in the last podcast, and I think they made a pretty compelling argument for why our sanctions framework against North Korea is not as robust as it could be, and I think that's fair but they did not make a compelling argument using empirical evidence for why sanctions, even robust sanctions, would have the effect we want, that we want in terms of changing North Korea's behavior. That being said, you know, there, there's a role for sanctions. We need to enforce it. There's the, the normative, the legal reasons why sanctions are necessary. Uh, but if we're thinking purely in terms of effectiveness and policy impact, I'm not seeing that. Uh, but again, it's one of the major tools that we have, but um, certainly not the only tool. Well, it's very clear that sanctions don't stop missile testing. Right. right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty clear. It doesn't stop. It doesn't, it doesn't stop missile testing. And I mean, I think, I mean, I, so I guess the way I would close this is that we don't have any answers, but I mean, we are in a very different situation that we were before, not just because of the external security environment, but because many of our working theories about how to deal with North Korea are, are deeply under question, right? So one of them clearly is sanctions, where, um, uh, I mean, North Korea during the three-year COVID lockdown has been under the most sanctions it's ever been under. I mean, you know, John Bolton would have loved to see this sort of <laughs> sanctions regime on North Korea, and it clearly hasn't changed behavior. And, the, and then the other big theory was China, right? That we could do this through and in partnership with China. Um, and uh, I, I can't remember the term that you used, Jenny, but when you said it, I. I, I, I agreed with it, um, um, but, but that um, we can't hope that put our bas all our eggs in the basket of China and think that they will do the work, the work for us. So um, anyway, so it's a very interesting discussion. Thank you both of, uh, both of you for joining us. Um, unfortunately, on the impossible state, we rarely have answers. <laughs> we have lots of questions and we have a lot of good discussion and debate. So thanks very much for joining us on this episode of the impossible state.